What do you get when you cross a vampire with a snowman? A vampire with a snowman. Frostbite. Frostbite. Well done. What goes up and never comes down? What goes up and never comes down? Your age. Are you reading my notes? What's happening over here? Okay, I don't know if you're going to get this one. What movie did the pirate watch? And what was it? What, oh, you didn't let me finish. Jeez. Man, you stole my thunder. Let's try that again. Pretend like you haven't heard this one, okay? What movie did the pirate watch and what was it rated? It was rated R. Okay, all right, all right. Man, I got to find another one. We can't end the semester with, with that. We can't end the semester with that. Okay, bonus joke. Uh, it, it, it was written by my kids, so there was no movie. It was just rated R. It actually wasn't that funny, and then I messed it up. So, so we're going to go with this one. We're going to erase that tape. Why don't cheetahs like to take baths? Why don't, keep it clean. Why don't cheetahs like to take baths? Because they don't want to be spotless. Oh, shame on you back there. I don't know what you said, but I'm sure it was dirty. Sure it was dirty. I heard the the chuckles. Okay, all right. Hey, you want to know something that's great? Is you guys think I'm funny now, because in the beginning of the semester, nobody laughed. And you might be laughing at me, which is totally okay, because that's all my kids ever do. All right. Well, it's been a fun semester. I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you. I really mean it. it, it I, I had to make a choice like, to come back and teach after a long hiatus in research uh, in an active classroom. You know, I've been teaching online, um, and, and doing this class that's big is a whole other beast. Uh, it's just, it takes a whole other level of commitment. And so uh, it's been fun, and um, I appreciate you all's attention, and um, I can't believe we're almost done. So the last lecture is on vision, and what we're covering today is, I think, um, a great topic for the very end of the semester because <clears throat> we're going to kind of finish this thing out with how the eye works and talk a little bit about um, the way we interact with our environment uh, visually because we're very visual as, or, as organisms. Our world is, is pretty much dominated by visual stimulation. And, um, <clears throat> you know, evidence of that is the way we interact with these right? Think about it, right? So in the old days, right, they were dumb phones. There was no screen, just like a number thing and a keypad. And they had flip versions and they had non-flip versions. And then Apple revolutionized things with a screen so you could actually interface with your device. And the marketing was crazy effective, like all of a sudden, and you all grew up as a generation, we're glued to these screens. And we see the world through these screens. Okay, And many of you are going to move on in medicine and science, and I think there will be data that will come out, some that's favorable, some that's not favorable. That's kind of how it works. But there will be an impact to our lives health-wise, based upon our interaction with these visible devices, right? Some of you count how long you're on it. Some, I know, you know, some of the students in my lab, you know, told me, like, they have roommates that actually fall asleep doing this, you know? And, and, and the equation, uh, the equivalent in the old days was keeping the, the TV on while you're trying to fall asleep because you needed kind of that constant stimulation, and there's data on that. So if you're interested in, in interesting research topics to study just from the, 
neuropsychology, you can look at some of the old TV interactions on neuropsych behavior uh, overstimulation, and I think we'll see a lot of parallels with these devices. But the point is all of us rely on these structures every day to interact. You know, and, and evidence of that is <clears throat> I'll talk to students in my lab and say, hey, well, we're trying to order this antibody. Um, did you get in touch with the company? Like, where's the antibody? Well, I, you know, I, I, sent, them, I sent them an email, and then I was, I was you know, messaging their technical support. I said, well, did you ever pick up the phone and call them? They're like, well, no, Dr. Keller, nobody does that. Like, you're the only person that calls me except for my mom. And I'm like, oh, okay, so I'll start texting you now. But we, we actually don't even really talk on these things anymore as much as we used to. Everything is visual interaction. Okay. <clears throat> so how the outside of the eye works is pretty cool. We've, we've obviously got eyebrows that help with glare, uh, kind of pr protect um, the eye from the orbit or from the frontal lobe of the skull. We have eye lashes that obviously keep dust and debris out of the eye itself. We have eyelids that open and close. Uh, every time the eyelid closes or blinks, you actually have a tear that moves from uh, the lateral aspect, from the lacrimal gland, all the way across in exits at the lacrimal punctum, down the lacrimal canal, and into the lacrimal sac. Every time you blink, you've got a tear that actually comes across from med uh, lateral to medial. It's pretty cool. It keeps everything clean. Um, we have a lot of sensation within the eye. You know, if you've got a little eyelash or you have a, a, a piece of dust, it feels like there's a stone or like a tree branch in your eye. If you wear contacts, there's a slight tear. You're like, I think I have a tumor in my eye or my, eye, my contact's torn. I mean, it feels huge. So the amount of sensory uh, detection within the eye is quite high. They're very precious to us. We have two. You have bilateral vision. If you lose one, you have a backup, right? As an organism, I'm actually not trying to be funny. Like in biology, when you have replication of things, it must be really important. Uh, fun fact, um, when we cry, you know, whether it's emotional based upon pain or, or uh, sorrow or it's tears of joy, uh, we get runny noses. Why? Well, this drains into the nose. And so all of these tears actually flush out into the nose. And <clears throat> you're constantly flushing the nasal canal all day long because you're constantly blinking all day long. When you wake up in the morning, you kind of have crud here and maybe you need to blow your nose, you've been flushing this all night long, keeping everything clean. The lateral, oh my gosh, my computer is, uh, sorry. I've been having issues with this computer. And um, they told me that they locked me out. Maybe I don't work here anymore. All right, let me see if I can fix this real quick. Give me one second. I'm going to see if I can. Okay, that might work. All right. So our lateral and our medial commissures, uh, these are actually where the eyelids meet, kind of the corners of the eye. You have one on the lateral aspect and on the medial aspect. The conjunctiva. The conjunctiva uh, covers the inside of your eyelids and the outside of the eyeballs. So it's an epithelium that 
allows for the, and is moist or wet or lubricious and allows for sliding of the eyelid over the outside of the eyeball. There's a mucus that's being secreted from the conjunctiva to keep things lubricated, right? And when that mucus is down or low in production, you actually have dry eye, which can be very irritable. Um, we talked about this lacrimal apparatus already as far as the tear, and the lacrimal apparatus is the lacrimal gland as well as the lacrimal canal. So all these structures exist on the outside of the eye and um, work in, in, in harmony to protect this critical structure, keep it um, moist, free from debris, um, you have lysozymes that are found within uh, the tears that actually are slightly antimicrobial because this is a mucous membrane, right? And during COVID, one of the early uh, recommendations, do you remember this? One of the early recommendations of how not to get COVID was to do what? what to, to not touch what? Not touch your eyes. And, and so we would wash our hands, we'd wear masks, and they would say, like, you know, don't, don't rub your eyes because you're, you're, you're actually a track right into uh, the body as a mucous membrane. Okay. So the makeup. We have structures as we move through the eye known as tunics. We have three tunics. Tunics is actually a word that means coat in the Latin. And we're going to see these tunics here on the next slide. But we also divide it up <clears throat> into what we call the optical apparatus as well as the neural apparatus. So there's optical, meaning managing the flow of light. And then neural, which is managing the electrical signal as it goes to the brain through cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve. So the optical apparatus focuses the light allows it to pass through, and the neural apparatus, which is made up of the retina and the optic nerve, allow for the photo signal to be received and converted into electrical signal. So our three tunics, tunica fibrosa, tunica vasculosa, and tunica interna. Tunica fibrosa this is the outermost layer. It's made up of the sclera, which is the white part of the eye. It's made up of a dense connective tissue. And the cornea. And the cornea is the clear portion that covers the iris as well as the pupil, right in the center of the eye. We'll talk a little bit more about the cornea a little bit later. So you can see on this picture, our cornea is clear allows light to pass through. And as you move away from the center, it turns into the white of the eye, or what we refer to as the sclera. And that makes up the tunica fibrosa. Tunica vasculosa, also referred to as the uvea, U-V-E-A, depending upon what textbook you're reading, made up of the choroid ciliary body and the iris. The choroid We've seen this sort of terminology before, the, like the choroid plexus. You remember that in the brain? So the, the choroid actually manufactures fluid, the aqueous humor that fills the front portion of the eye. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. The ciliary bodies right here hold the lens in place. And then the iris is the colored part of your eye that can open up or contract, allowing for more or less light to come in through the pupil. And then the last tunic or layer, coat, is the interna, which by terminology is inside, and it's made up exclusively of the retina. Now, interesting, the, the back of the eye that we'll see here is actually an extension of the brain, right, the optic nerve the telencephalon, and we'll get there um, <clears throat> in a little bit. Okay, cornea. <clears throat> so just a different picture. 
This scanning electron micrograph up top shows the lens and the suspensory ligaments that actually hold it in place. And <clears throat> you can see down here in this cartoon, here's the lens. We've got a posterior chamber, which is the back of the eye, that's filled of like a jelly-like solution known as the vitreous body or the vitreous humor. And then we have an anterior chamber or the front part of the eye that's in front of the lens that actually is filled with aqueous humor. And this ciliary body, um, with respect to the ciliary process, um, is what manufactures this fluid, releases it into this uh, posterior chamber of the anterior uh, segment, right? This is the vitreous body here, posterior, and then up here is anterior. And then it flows through the opening of the pupil and drains through this scleral venous sinus, which is referred to as the canal of Schlem. We don't really use that terminology more because, again, it's named after somebody, but uh, this is a sinus, kind of the circulation that you see. What does it remind you of? What kind of circulation have we seen before where we've got fluid being released at a choroid type of structure flowing through a pathway and then being reabsorbed into a venous circulation? Do you remember? Anybody? Cerebral spinal fluid, right? I just, I just wanted to see if you could make some parallels here. So we've seen this type of thing before. And we'll come back to this here in a second when we talk about eye pressure, intraocular eye pressure. I don't remember the first day of class if I asked if there's going to be any ophthalmologists in the room or optometrists. But, you know, if so, you'll nerd out on some of these structures especially when we get to things like uh, glaucoma, which has a, a problem with intraocular pressure, or you get into cataracts. Maybe your grandparents have uh, drops for glaucoma, or they had cataract surgery, right? and they had to wear an eye patch for a little while, or really cool sunglasses that cover half of their face. Right? So we'll talk about some of those things here in a moment. The lens itself, these suspensory ligaments, um, allow for the lens to contract. The, the, the ligament causes the lens to flatten. So when they contract, pull on the lens, the lens actually gets narrower and flattens. And then we already talked about the posterior most aspect of the eye or the back of the eye, the vitreous body. So just to make sure it's not confusing, the front of the eye in front of the uh, lens has an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber which is where your aqueous uh, uh, humor flows. The back of the eye, the vitreous body, is jelly-like. It's the posterior most aspect, but it's different than the posterior chamber. Understood? This is jelly-like. It doesn't circulate. You just have it. When you did your dissections with your sheep eyes, when you punctured through this and you got into the vitreous body, that's when that jelly kind of popped out. You remember that? Some of you are like, I'm trying to forget it. Okay, that's when it like splashed or shot. Cutting through here, there's not a lot of pressure typically unless the patient has glaucoma. So, so let's talk about glaucoma. Glaucoma, there's a slide at the end, but we'll just kind of talk about it now, is a abnormal buildup in pressure, aqueous humor pressure within the anterior chamber. It ultimately puts pressure on the posterior chamber, which puts pressure on the vitreous body or the back of the eye. And so adding pressure here puts pressure here, which puts pressure here. And then the, the retina, which you can't see, is at the back of the vitreous body. And if it's pressurized, you're going to put pressure on the nerve. And that's why blindness can happen. Now, having high intraocular pressure because you're either making too much fluid or you're not draining it fast enough, what does that remind you of? Uh, encephal uh, hydrocephaly. Hydrocephaly. You remember that? We talked about Runa Begum, that Indian girl. 
Um, it's kind of a sad story, but it, it resonates, I think, with, with students on how, how serious this condition is. Same issue there. So you can either reduce the production of the fluid or you can increase the drain, just like what you do with hydrocephalus. And a lot of those drops that patients use for glycoma do exactly that. They'll either suppress this or they'll encourage the draining by dilating the venous circulation so it's bigger, so the sink can drain the fluid faster. Okay. Neural apparatus. So this is all optical apparatus, kind of the front of the eye. Now we're back in the back of the eye. And if you're a future ophthalmologist, and kind of the difference is ophthalmology is a study within medicine. Usually you go to medical school and then you focus on eye. So most ophthalmologists are MDs. An optician is one who focuses on contacts and glasses. He does eye exams, but may not actually do surgery or have a medical degree that allows for all the different things that an ophthalmologist can do. That's kind of optician versus ophthalmology, okay? But ophthalmologists are really interested in the health of the retina. And so this is a retinal picture. You, know, you go get an eye exam, a lot of times they'll say, hey, every so often we should get a picture of your retina so we have a map. And we can see if you've got any degeneration, if you've got any spots or any issues, any cancer at the back of the eye. And your retinal scan is unique to you, just like fingerprints just like your skin microbiome, the bacteria that live on your skin or in your gut or in your lungs. All right, there's a lot of uniqueness to us. It's not just differences in our fingerprints and our DNA. Our retina is unique, and that's why in spy movies, retinal scans actually work. Okay. Uh, here's a, a cartoon drawing of, of kind of the vasculature at the back of the eye. You can see it's well vascularized with arteries and veins. There's um, a region known as the macula lutea, and the macula lutea houses our fovea centralis and our optic disc. So the macula lutea is sort of a patch of sensory cells somewhat in the center of the eye. And the fovea centralis, which means central focus, is an area of the eye where you've got a high density of cones, and cones are for sharp resolution of images, and they also allow for color vision. So that's right in the center of the eye. It's very close to where the optic disc actually comes into the eye, right? Or the optic nerve um, actually enters at the level of the optic disc. The, um, the retina is the back part of the eye. This is an outgrowth of the telencephalon. If you remember, the telencephalon is uh, technically it's, it's the, the forebrain or the cerebrum, a portion of the brain. So the back of your eye, the retina, is actually part of your brain. So you're literally bringing in photons, light, energy, photoreceptors that we're going to talk about, rods and cones, and you're projecting them on a screen, which is technically your brain itself. Pretty weird, huh? Like this vision of all of you staring at me right now is actually being projected onto my telencephalon, the retina, a part of my brain. The vitreous body in the back actually holds the eyeball open and helps spread the retina, flatten out that screen uh, at the rear of the eyeball so that it can be nice and organized without any folds. <clears throat> so developmentally, if patients are born with oblong or altered shapes of the eyeball, it can actually cause problems with the way the image focuses. Now, the optic disc is the point of entry. Like, what is this uh, uh, picture at the bottom? I don't know if this is going to work from where you're sitting. It works on your screen. You might have to do this at home, but can try it right now. 
So the, the optic nerve, cranial nerve 2, comes into the back of the eye and enters at the point of the optic disc. So right where the nerve connects, there are no photoreceptors. There's no rods and cones. That's considered your blind spot. And so this is a little exercise where if you cover your right eye, okay, and you look at the X, the X, this is going to be, I'm not going to ask you to chew gum at the same time. Cover your right eye, and with your left eye, you're looking at the X. And see if you can kind of move in and out of the screen and make the red dot disappear. For me, it's like right here. Okay? If you can continuously see it, it's because you can't really change it from the screen. You can do it on your device if you're taking notes. So you're covering your right eye, you're looking at the X, and this will disappear at some location as you move the screen. And, and that's exactly where that image now is being focused on the back of the eye, but it's being focused on your optic disc or your blind spot. So here's the good news. Your blind spots are going to be different from your left and your right eye, right? Because they're separate from each other. You have two different nerves. So you're not compromised typically um, throughout daily life because you've got binocular vision. And vision is the one situation where we get what we call hemidecussation, right? So hemidecussation, what, what, is the, what is the definition of decussate when something decussates in the brain? It switches sides, perfect. So hemidecussation means information from my left eye comes in, half of the information goes to my right hemisphere, half of the information goes to my left hemisphere. And that's unique uh, in, in mammals. So we have hemidecussation. So this blind spot activity, try it later. It'll probably work at home on your computer or on your, your tablet or your iPad. So <clears throat> moving in light is really important. And we've got pupillary constrictors, circular smooth muscle that help to control constriction of the pupil. Pupillary dilators, which are smooth muscle that radiates out like a wheel or like spokes of a wheel. And they actually control dilation. So it's not just relaxing the muscle opens it up and contracting the muscle closes it. You actually have two separate muscles so that you can move your, your, your pupil quickly. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like you have two completely different muscles. The pupillary constrictors that are circular smooth muscle operate like this to constrict things down. The dilators, obviously they're going to relax, but the dilators, like spokes of a wheel, actually constrict this way and open things up. So pupil control, if you remember, is under sympathetic as well as parasympathetic innervation, right? We had dual innervation when we talked about it. And now you're seeing at the muscle level, ah, if we're duly innervated, that also means we have two different sets of muscles that actually, it's like having a brake and an accelerator, right? So you want to take your foot off the accelerator and then hit the brake if you want to stop really fast. But you could slow down by just taking your foot off the accelerator and just waiting for yourself to come to a stop. Okay, so but here you've got control. Changes in size happen um, when light intensity changes. So in dark light, you're going to dilate and allow more light to come in. In bright light, you'll constrict, allow less light to go in. Now, over on the right side is, is control of the lens. So this is control of the pupil. This is control of the lens. If you're taking notes, you might want to say pupil control, lens control, because we're going to kind of get into lens physiology here in a second. So in this situation, which is far vision, emetropia, this top image, our ciliary muscles are actually relaxed. And you've got tight suspensory ligaments that actually stretches the lens out or thins the lens. Here, when the ciliary muscles contract, the suspensory ligaments are relaxed and the lens thickens. And this is near vision or what we call accommodation. 
So this is how we change the shape of the lens to be able to read or to be able to look far away. Now, what happens as, as we get older, and, and you know, it happened to me about two years ago, and usually it happens for most patients at about 40 to 41 years of age, 40 to 42 years of age, most patients are needing reading glasses. Because as we age, the lens gets stiffer, and so it has a difficult time relaxing and thickening out. And so we use reading glasses as we get older in our 40s and beyond, okay? But normally, what the lens does is it refracts light. Now, it reflects some light um, to help focus the image in the right spot. But the structure that refracts the most light is actually the cornea. So that's the clear part of the eye, clear part of the eye around it, if you're talking about the outermost adventitial layer. Around it's the sclera. The cornea is the clear spot that the light comes through. And it does the most amount of bending of light. And so bending of light, I know this is not a physics class, and many of you, it's been a while since you've had physics or you didn't have physics, but let's just walk through a very simple example. How many of you had a pool growing up? Okay. How many of you have swam in a pool? Oh, better. And the people that have their hands up that had a pool? Had a pool or swam in a pool? Raise your hands. Okay, some of you aren't raising your hands. So how many of you have heard of a swimming pool? Okay, that should be everybody. Okay, sweet, sweet. So now that we're all on the same page, um, so the best analogy is, I can remember as a kid, one of my chores was sweeping the pool with the pool uh, brush. Long pole of the brush, and I was supposed to sweep down and get the dirt off the side of the plaster so that the vacuum could, you know, sweep it up or it could go into the filter. And when you did this, this straight pole bent underwater. You understand what I'm talking about? You've seen this, right? You've reached in to try to grab something on your water, and you're like, wait a sec, it's in the wrong spot from what I see. That's because light bends in different mediums. And this air, this N, is the refractive index of light. In air, the refractive index is 1.0. In fluids, you can see in the aqueous humor, the refraction of uh, the um, re uh, index of refraction of light is 1.33. In the vitreous body, body it's 1.33. And the cornea is 1.38. The lens is 1.4. So the moment it goes from air to the lens, or sorry, through the cornea, it bends. The light bends in all of us. It's inevitable because it's not air. The other thing that's nice is once it comes in, it's in pretty much a fluid medium. So the bending is like everything's happening within the pool. Once you get underwater and you start swimming underwater with your, with your goggles on, there isn't any weirdness to where things are located. It's just when you're looking from the side of the pool in the water that things change because the light bends from air to water. So one of the other benefits of having all of this fluid in here is you've got a consistent flow, 1.3 to 1.4, 1.33 to 1.4 of the refractive index of light. Okay? There's a question. So, when That's a great question. The question's about sun damage. So, I was going to get there a little bit here on this slide. The um, structure that actually gets damaged the most as we age by the sun, is actually the cornea. And the cornea is uh, made up of a protein, and the UV light actually cross-links the protein. So when proteins cross-link, do you remember the uh, egg example in the beginning of the semester with albumin? Like if you crack an egg, it's uncross-linked, and what color is the white part of the egg? Clear. As you heat it up and you cross-link the albumin, what color does it become? Opaque white. Same thing happens to the lens as the UV light cross-links it, and that's what we call cataracts. So cataracts 
are cross, sun cross-linked portions of the, of the cornea that the, the sun is actually cross-linked and makes it cloudy. So it's harder to see. Here's another example. How many of you have an older automobile where your headlights are foggy? Do you know what I'm talking about? They used to be, you're thinking about getting a kit that says, oh, you put this on and you polish it. And it, and it actually really work. Did it on a couple of my kids' uh, vehicles. That's the same thing. So there's polymers in that plastic that the sun is cross-linking. So as the car ages, the clear headlight turns cloudy, and that's what you're seeing with these cloudy headlights. That's exactly what happens with your cornea. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, I, I totally believe it. Yeah, it's more of a training thing. Yeah. Okay, so the lens itself, which is back here, the cornea is in front, it actually fine tunes the image and bends it so that the image focuses clearly on the screen, which is the retina. So the analogy would be, and, and you've probably all seen this, you, you're doing a presentation, you've got a projector, or maybe you're, you're gonna, you have a portable projector, you're going to do a movie outside in the summertime, you have a screen, and you set it up, and it's blurry. And you can, you, can, you can adjust the focus without even touching the projector just by moving it closer or moving it further away, right? So when it's blurry, either the image is actually in focus closer to you or somewhere behind the screen. And that's what we're showing down here with these different vision issues. So common lens problems. So normal, emetropia, normal, is where the image is actually focused right on the retina, the screen. That actually is the telencephalon of the brain, where the optic nerve comes in and you can see the image. In hyperopia, farsightedness, Uncorrected, the focal plane is behind the screen. So what we do is we use a convex lens optically, whether it's glasses or contacts, and we move the focus to be in the plane on the retina. Hyperopia, farsightedness. In the situation of myopia, where the image is actually in front of the retina and you use a concave lens to, to push it back, correct it so that it focuses, and this is actually referred to as nearsighted or myopia. So presbyopia, number one, is a loss of lens flexibility. So presbyopia, is, as, as we age, the lens loses its flexibility. And oftentimes we need reading glasses as a result because it won't relax enough when we're close up. And, and that's the category I'm in now. Hyperopia, farsighted, the eyeball's too short, you can't see things close up. Hyperopia. You can't see things close up, so you're far-sighted. You, th you see things far away, but you can't see things close up. Myopia, or nearsightedness, is you can't th see things far away because the eyeball's too long. The eyeball's too long, and the image is focused short, so you need to correct it. Important terms for you to know for Monday. Important terms for you to know. Hyperopia, myopia. Farsightedness is hyperopia. Myopia is nearsightedness. Normal vision, emetropia. Presbyopia, the lens loses its flexibility. And then the last one is astigmatism, which is the upper right image. Astigmatism is where you have a misshapen cornea. So astigmatism is, is typically you're born with it. It could happen during 
you know, adolescence, when you grow and your lens actually grows too thick, I'm sorry, your cornea grows too thick, but it's a misshapen cornea. We talked a little bit about glaucoma. Um, and, and so glaucoma, the, the, the pressure issue is increased intraocular pressure on the optic nerve, which can result in blindness. But the problem is actually up front in the anterior portion of the eye, and we talked about that, where you're either manufacturing too much fluid or you're not draining it quick, uh, quick enough, and it builds up the pressure um, in the back of the eye. The last thing that um, I want to share with you that, that I kind of skipped over is eye color, right? And we talked about skin color. Let's talk about eye color for a moment. So eye color, what do you think gives you the color of your eyes, whether they're, let's say they're brown or black, based upon what we know about skin? Melanin. Okay, so the amount, the relative amount of melanin that you make will actually result in the colored part of the eye, which is what? The iris. And if it's producing copious amounts of melanin, it's a dark black. If it's a lighter amount of melanin, then it's a brown. Well, what about blue, hazel, green? Yeah, so the other shades that aren't brown and black are actually absence of melanin, and there's a refraction in the iris from the outside environment, and you're seeing a refraction of light, kind of why, like, like same thing that happens with the sky. That's why the sky's blue, right? Because of the refraction of light. So you have less melanin, and you know, with, with hazel eyes, there's a little bit there, less than brown. With blue, there's pretty much none. Green eyes, there's a little bit there, but you're getting sort of this aberration as light comes in. Here and then here. How come people with albinism don't have red eyes? Albinism, people that have albinism have red eyes. Where do you think the red's coming from? Blood, yeah. It's a more of a structure. You're seeing a structure. You're seeing the red in the retina. What about what? Oh, heterochromia, where you have different colored eyes. Yeah, so that's unique, where you got one eye. Like, there are strains of dogs that have that. Like, huskies will have, like, one brown, one blue. So during development, you know, uh, one recessive trait is, is dominant in the left eye or the right eye, and you'll have a lack of melanin. You'll get more of a blue eye. Or, and then the other one, you'll have a brown eye because you have the production of melanin. It's pretty, pretty unique. Don't see it often in humans, but other mammals you do. Oh, not necessarily. They're, they're, they're coded differently, different genes. So the question was skin, skin production of melanin versus eye production of melanin. They're, they're coded in different genes. So just because you have darker brown skin doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have darker brown eyes. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely more dominant or recessive characteristics. So brown and black eyes are, more, are dominant features in the gene expression from a Mendelian genetic standpoint. And all the other colors are recessive. So my wife has green eyes, and I have brown. And we had four kids, and we got none with green eyes. Yeah. And she's left-handed, and we got 25% of the Putnam Square being left-handed. My youngest is left-handed. So the Mendelian genetics worked out on right-handedness versus left-handedness, but not green versus brown eyes. Yeah. My kids hate it when I talk about them like that, but that's, that's the reality of it. Yeah. Uh, lazy eye. So developmentally with lazy eye or a straying eye, um, it, it's a weakness in the muscles that actually control the eyeball itself, 
Not necessarily the vision that we're talking about. It's the, it's the muscles that actually surround the eye and actually move the eyeball up and down. And you have uh, basically postural muscles on one eye that are weakly developed. So we can correct for it um, with lenses. You can correct for it with occupational therapy. You can correct for it with surgery or all of the above. Oftentimes, children, if, if they're intervened early, will grow out of their lazy eye. Great questions. Okay, last couple of slides, last segment. Um, we're going to talk about vision. And what's interesting about vision is it kind of goes reverse. So if you look at this picture, the back of the eye is at the top. The back of the eye is at the top, and light is coming in here through the cornea, then through uh, the pupil, then through the lens, and it passes through all these cells in the back of the eye, and it actually activates these cells first, the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors, they're not chemoreceptors, they're not mechanoreceptors, they're photoreceptors. So what do they detect? Light. The visible spectrum of light, that's what they see. That's what they respond to. But they're back here. And when they're activated, they send a signal to our first order neurons, which are our bipolar cells, which then send a signal to our second order neurons, which are ganglion cells. They are the ones that are connected to the optic nerve or cranial nerve two. So it passes all the way, it bypasses these cells that eventually are going to be sending the signal, which I think is interesting. It's actually wired somewhat reverse, in my opinion. All of the light passes through these cells. They activate these cells. These cells are non-responsive to light. The bipolar cell gets the signal from the photoreceptor, which sends it to the second order neuron, which is the ganglion cell, which innervates onto the nerve fiber that collects to the optic nerve to go to the brain. Make sense? So <clears throat> I want to unpack this pigmented epithelium on the back of the eye um, because we've got two different types. We've got cones, about 6.5 million cones, which detect color, C, C, alliteration to remember. Rods, 130 million, far more prevalent, and they detect black and white, or grayscale, maybe a better way to phrase it. <clears throat> All of these photoreceptors converge on a limited number of bipolar cells. You can see there's more of these. There's fewer bipolar cells. So they kind of collect the signal and send that signal to the second order neuron. There's a synapse. There's a neurotransmitter, just like you all learned. But ultimately, the action potential goes via cranial nerve two. So comparing and contrasting the two photoreceptors. So we're back here, photoreceptors. We have a picture here of a rod. It looks like a rod, like a cylinder, much bigger, more pronounced, higher number of them. And these are cones because they look like cones, <laughs> OK? The cones come actually in three types, a red, a blue, or a green. And that's the type of light that they see, a red, a blue, and a green. The rods are utilizing what a molecule that we're going to look at here in a second known as rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is made up of an opsin protein and a retinal protein. And it bleaches in the presence of light. So light hits it. A component of it bleaches. It goes through a conformational change. That triggers an action potential. Same thing that happens down here with cones. You just use a variation of rhodopsin known as photopsin, and you've got three types, red, blue, and green. If you look at the difference between the two, these are cells. They're specialized cells. They have a nucleus. They have mitochondria, right? They have synaptic endings. They're a nerve cell. And inside of these, you've got these activity proteins that allow you to fire either red, blue, green, or you fire a light 
versus a dark signal with respect to rods. So <clears throat> the cones are primarily in the center part of your retina. They're, they're for sharp acuity. Like when I'm looking at you with the light on, I can see colors. I can see pink shirts and green shirts and red pants and black hoodies and white shirts. If we turn all the light off, all the color fades and it's just more grayscale. And the rods are in high um, propensity, but they're more on your peripheral vision. So do this, do this trick at night. You're getting up, you're gonna, the room's dark and you're trying to find your way around your bedroom you know, to the bathroom or to the kitchen and make it as pitch black as you can. Try to look out of the periphery of your vision. It'll actually be easier to see because you actually use your rods, which are in higher density on the periphery. Or go up here in Flagstaff. It's really easy to do. Go, go out a remote area uh, in town. Look at the sky. Look at the stars on a clear night. And then find a, find a uh, cluster that you want to look at and kind of look over here and look at it out of the corner of your eye, it'll look brighter. You go here and you go here, it'll be brighter when you're looking at it out of the corner of your eye because your vision for dark, it won't work in this room. Some of you are looking up going, Keller, you're weird. Okay, Try it while you're night gazing, okay, or while you're trying to wander through your dark bedroom. Okay, last physiology slide for the entire semester. Okay, yeah. How does the cycle work? <clears throat> so we have a photochemical reaction. You have light that comes in. You've got a protein, rhodopsin. This is for night vision, rhodopsin for rods. And <clears throat> this rhodopsin is made up of an opsin protein and a retinal protein. And the retinal, <clears throat> you ever hear this from your, your mom or dad? You should eat your carrots. It's good for your vision. Okay. So retinol is in high um, uh, uh, composition in beta carotene uh, foods like carrots. So there actually is some truth to that. It wasn't just that they're trying to get you to eat your vegetables. So retinol, a lot of, a lot of you know, carrots are in high, uh, have a high amount of ret, uh, retinoic acid and retinol in it. But these two molecules, opsin and retinol, when light hits it, you do a conformational change from a cis retinol, where this retinol is bent, to see how it's straight. It goes from cis to trans. And this is chemistry terms, where you go through this conformational change, and then this cis to trans um, goes through a reaction where the opsin actually dissociates from the rhodopsin. And this triggers a cascade using cyclic GMP that actually creates your action potential in that cell. This is recycled. The opsin is recycled in a dark cycle. <clears throat> the trans moves back to cis. It's reincorporated and ready for the next cycle. So it's just a photo bleaching through a conformational change of opsin and retinol as it sees light. And that's what sends your signal. The, the cones do the same thing. They're just specific for blue wavelength, green wavelength, or uh, red. Pretty cool. So <clears throat> let me wrap up by saying it has been a lot of fun. Uh, really grateful for you all. Thanks for sticking through the whole semester. That's the end of the new content that I have for you. And if you want to stick around, I'd be happy to go over some questions in review from you all about content, whether it's old content or new content, in preparation for Monday's final at what time? Three o'clock, where? Right here, okay? Have a great weekend.